everybody. Welcome to another. You didn't like that one? Or are you just waving to me? Hi. <laughs> I said, Dip. Hi, Rita. Hey. What's going on, Reese? Hey, everyone. Welcome, hey everybody. everybody. Welcome to another fabulous edition of Rock and Roll Confessional. I'm C.W. West, and this is Rita Wild. A big thank you to all of our new Patreon supporters, including Sean Lewis. Thank you so much, Sean Lewis. For your support. If you love us or just like us, please go to Patreon and pledge as little as a dollar a month. You can also go to our support page on our website. That's like giving up one cup of coffee a month. That's it. Your pledge will help us stay alive, and it allows us to keep bringing these fantastic shows to you. Gasoline, transportation, all that sort of fun Ed, stuff. Don't forget editing and equipment. Well, that we pay that to the <laughs> intern, right? <laughs> which, yeah. For, which is you. Yeah. <laughs> intern CW. I remember that was about 35 years ago. I was yeah, interning, know. and now I'm doing it again. That's all right. We're all interning. Oh, if you listen on Apple Podcasts, we ask that you please subscribe to us, rate us, and write a review. Every single review helps move us up to the top of the rock podcast charts. And believe me, we are trying to get to be number one. Number one. Number, number one, one. Or at least top ten. Come on. Come on, people now. Smile on your brother. We also wanted to read a review from a very kind listener. Uh, great start. Episode one. Witty, interesting, and delightful. An in-depth journey into the realities of radio broadcasting and the fascinating world of video game voiceover. Be sure to listen to the whole episode. It's worth the ear time. Thank uh, you. That's very cute. Very cute. So, Reitz, this episode, we are speaking with an amazing philanthropist, Leo Rossi. Love him. He's so awesome. We know Leo from many years ago at the radio station. Not too many, but many. Yeah, no, he was the manager of Dishwalla. But, you know, he started his career as a lighting director for concerts in Long Beach, California, at the Long Beach Arena, with Led Zeppelin being one of his first shows. How cool is that? That was pretty amazing. He went on to be a roadie, or as he prefers, road crew, or tech. tech. As we learned. Tech. Not roadie. Not roadie. Tech. In the lighting department for such acts as The Who, Fleetwood Mac, Al Jarreau, Bette Midler, and The Beach Boys, just to name a few. After all the years in music business, Leo has now shifted to becoming a philanthropist and give back to the world by donating his time and any profits to the charity 20K Watts, a charity that his late son began years ago and Leo is now carrying the torch for. Leo gives us some insight into touring with bands like Fleetwood Mac and the Beach Boys when Leo was starstruck by a very famous guitarist. Plus, Leo has story after story of being on the road, and it's an amazing show. So here we go with Leo Rossi on the Rock and Roll Confessional. Well, here we are, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Rock and Roll Confessional. Reitz, how is it going today? Pretty good there. I love being on location. We are on location in beautiful San Pedro, California. Ah, uh, Pedro. Don't say Pedro. The, the locals will San kill you. San Pedro. Yeah, you say Pedro. They'll come in here. They'll break the door down. And really? Attack it's us. Op- the door's open, you know. <laughs> okay, well. Can they just open it and say, come down and kick my ass? <laughs> Pedro. 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 <laughs> so vote, for, vote, vote for Pedro. For Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, take it away, Reitz. Uh It's our pleasure and our honor to uh, to be here in San Pedro, hometown of our guest, who is a gentleman by the name of Leo Rossi. Leo uh, helped us immensely with many Mark and Brian shows uh, because he's a guy that just about does everything. Or has done everything. Or just about <laughs> has done everything, you know, when it comes to rock and roll. And that's great stuff. Uh, tour director, lighting director. And for some of the biggest acts in the business, and I can't wait to get into some of the stories, but Leo has just put out a book called When the Devil Smiles, the Angels Frown, a uh, really enjoyable book. So welcome, Leo Rossi. Thank you. Hey, thank Leo. you. God, thank you so much. It's good to see you guys again. You too. You. God, Me it's too. been like, feels like yesterday, but it's been a while. It's been a while. It's been a while. It's been a few years. Yeah, yeah. So it's called how you guys, how do you guys not age? Look at me and look at you guys. No, nah. you've been aged. We looked oh, at the yeah. book. <laughs> you got the same beads and everything. Yeah, yeah. same jewelry, right? Same right. bling. You know, we're all the same. Yeah. yeah. It's all good. Um, so it's called Rock and Roll Confessional. So we usually start off by asking, what would you like to confess? I've been thinking about this. So 
you know, I do these these inspirational shows, and the always the questions I get: Who's your favorite artist? And you know, who's the hardest artist? And you know, and, and you know, and 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 as we say, you know, we don't. They're none of them were hard. They were challenging and difficult, but none were hard. But when they they always ask me, you know, who who is your favorite artist you ever toured with? Um, I, I fib and I say I don't have an artist. You know, I don't have a favorite. You know, like children, but. Then again, as you say in my book, I always say my daughter's my favorite out of all the sons, so I, I, I'm sort of being hypocritical. So I really do have a favorite artist, so that's my confession. Who is it? Yeah. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I'm just telling you I do have a favorite. <laughs> well, is that someone you worked with? Yes. Okay. Stevie Nicks. It, does it have an F and an M in the name? No. Oh. F and an M. Fleetwood Mac. Oh, I, I, you I know just what? went let's, 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 let's define favorite. Okay. It's not about who they are or what they are or how they acted or what they did for me. I think it's the presence of traveling with them and to see the impact that they've made on the world that probably, you know, w w would sustain beyond music and into history. How's that? I still want to know who yeah, it is. Yeah, you still worked with too many. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll say it. Say okay. it. His name is Brian Wilson. Oh, really? Uh, because everywhere we went, uh, there wasn't one person that didn't. I mean, actors, actresses, artists, uh, plain people, normal people that came up and actually said that this man has literally changed our lives. That's interesting. So um, working with Brian Wilson for me has just been um, one of the most amazing, amazing things I've, I've ever done. Oh, my God. I love When I was love the last that. time you worked with him? Uh, 2015. Really? Was that for it was the Jeff Beck Brian Wilson oh, tour? Oh wow! Yeah. And what did, what was your role in that? I tour? I was a tour director. And as a tour director, what do you have to do? You're like the CEO of a corporation. Okay. You so know, you make you every make decision. Every, no, with with management, which was his wife Melinda and um, their financial people. You know, but you're making the everyday decisions everyday while you're decisions, on the road, putting the tour together with the agents, doing the P and L, and then there's a tour producer, and you know, so all roads come through me. I hire a really good production team, good financial team, good security. Um, and with Jeff, you know, being on the tour, it was like two tours in one. So I, I was right in the middle. I had a tour manager for Jeff and I had a tour manager for Brian. So you oversaw the entire tour between the, the, the entire, two of them. Right, exactly. Yeah, which was interesting. It was an interesting package. Yeah. And then you worked with the Beach Boys. Uh, for the uh, Well, I started with the Beach Boys in 77 as a lighting grunt and everybody in the industry has worked with the Beach Boys. <laughs> You know, Not we have me. This, you know, well, we, well, we have this joke. Someone said, hey, we should do a reunion of everybody who's worked for the Beach Boys. And they said, let's do it in Vegas. And one other guy said, there's not a hotel big enough. <laughs> not big uh. enough. <laughs> so, but yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, over the years in 82, I did the 20th anniversary. And, you know, off and on, we all have worked for him. But I did the 50th anniversary tour. Uh, and it's a weird story. I have an actual performance of how I did that. And that tour was just amazing. It actually saved my life, that tour. It changed my life and it saved my life at the same time. Wasn't it until the very end? The very end was fine. You know, I think the press blew it out of control. I mean, you know, look, there's a lot of, there's so many stories about Mark, Mike and Brian and the wives and everything. And, you know, for me, it was just like everybody had their own passion and opinions of what should be happening. And they voiced it. And no one was right. And nobody was wrong. And it's the end of a tour, and everyone's fried. Well, I would you think, know, and yeah, tired. and tired, and you know, and sure, we could have went out and made more. You know, it was fifty big ones was the name of the record. Fifty shows, fifty dates. We ended up doing I don't know, hundred dates plus, and it went from just in America to overseas, and it grew. But uh, you know. Um, you know, uh, Mike Love had prior commitments. You know, and they were smaller dates, but. You know, you got to give it to him. He didn't want to break those commitments. And by that time, yeah, there were some frayed feelings and everything else. But, you know, you hear about, you hear all the nonsense, but, you know, I was 10 feet from it every day. And everybody wasn't, you know, there was no right, there was no wrong. Everybody had their own opinion of what it was. And it, to me, it, if you ask everybody who was on the tour, it ended beautifully, you know, and it was really, really an amazing tour to be on. I think I, love I, that. I think one of the important things is, you know, even when we did promotions in, in radio, it's not the behind the scenes of putting everything together. It's what's the final outcome. And you know what? If that audience walks away loving the Beach Boys and has so much great things to say about them, then you, then you did a fabulous job. Well, it was a joke. A 50th anniversary was a joke. It's like 50 years. Who, you know, if someone told us back in the 70s we were <laughs> yeah. doing a 50th anniversary, right. we, we, you know, it, it was a joke. And then all of a sudden when the Beach Boys pulled it off, everybody started doing it. 
even James Bond had a 50th anniversary, you know? So what, what happened was I had just lost my son to cancer and I was really in a dark hole. And, uh, one of my friends was the production manager and he came to me and said, Hey, would you think about that? It's gotten big and they need a good tour director. Would you think about it? Because him and I did John Fogarty and some other things together. So I went and met the band and I met Jeff Foskett, who's an old friend from the Beach Boy days, was, you know, the musical director for Brian. And, um, I went to rehearsals and it was a mess and I decided I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to go back on the road. Mm -hmm. Then our good friend, Tony Dimitriotis, uh, ended Mm -hmm. up becoming one of the tour producers. So he called me up and said, Hey, this is a lot like Fleetwood Mac. I think you'll dig it and maybe you should get back on the road. And I was driving home from the meeting with Tony and I had this feeling of, you know, being pushed and, you know, I don't know, divine intervention, spiritual, my son, whatever it was, some, something told me, you know, grab, get on it and get your smile back, you know? And so I took it and it, it did, it saved my life. It was great people, but there were warring factions. Oh, yeah. You know, we had two music directors, two production managers, and Mike's group did something completely different the way Brian's group did it. So I think I was called in to sort of, you know, smooth over the edges and, 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 but, but, you know, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. I, I, I loved it. You've had so many big uh, shows that you've been a part of. Should we go back to the beginning? Because sure. I find your, I, I find, I, I, know, I, <laughs> I find, Scary, huh? I find the, the story so relatable because it was something that you loved and you just kind of, kind of got pushed. Maybe it was, a, maybe it wasn't. Whoever knows what it was, but you kind of got pushed in that direction of, of learning about lighting. And, yeah. you know, that became your passion, your heart, your soul. And it was more than just work. But anyway, why don't you tell us a story about little Leo from uh, San Pedro? Well, I grew up here in San Pedro, um, strict Italian Catholic. My parents were, you know, from Italy. And um, I had overachieving siblings. You know, my brothers and sisters were being pushed. My brother was the first Italian male. So he had the pressure of being a doctor and a lawyer. And then, you know, here I was the fourth child for nine years. And all of a sudden, my little brother gets born at nine years into my life. And, you know, then there there I was right in the middle of pride and joy. And that <laughs> always made me forget. I felt like I was the forgotten child. You know, I had I had some huge insecurity about. So as I say in my show, you know, tension was love and love was attention. And I always needed to sort of be noticed, you know, and that, that sort of what drove me a lot through my life. So when... I started realizing that <laughs> these little quirks of fate started to happen, you know, and, 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 and so I, I literally, I was registering for high school and I had no idea. I mean, I was going to be a longshoreman and I think that's what my dad had planned for me, which like I said, it's a great job. It was, you know, it's a lot of money, job. Yeah. retirement, yeah. but you know, it wasn't for me. Like I said, I was registering for high school and this teacher was desperate. He just needed one more student and he can get the hell out. I asked him what it was and he said, it's stage production. And I, well, what is that? He goes, you know just trust me, there's no homework. It's fun. It's easy. And, you know, and, and guess what? You get to do the assembly. So you get, you to get out of class a lot. It's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Sign me up. But it did. It became my favorite part of the day because I was with all these other ar- artistic misfits that had the same feeling that I did. So as I started getting into the lighting and, and, and getting into play production, I realized that, um, you can mess with people's emotions by put a red light on the stage and people get antsy, put blue light and they calm down. And I was learning all these from a really good teacher and then got invited to go see a play at the Long Beach Civic Light Opera at the old Long Beach Auditorium. And um, it was crazy that uh, (laughs) I saw an open door at intermission. I hated the show and I snuck backstage (laughs) and I just walked back and I sat back and I watched the show, the second half of the show. And it was just magic. I mean, there was lights and scenery and people. Wow. I even smelt the sweat off the actors. Yeah. It was so incredibly, you know, every sense was crazy. So then, you know, the show ended and here I am ready to walk out. And I st- <laughs> that, that was my task, <laughs> Get, sneak back out. But I got caught. So I got caught and I got in trouble. And next thing you know, they my punishment was to be a stagehand. I had to work it off. Oh, too bad. <laughs> right? So that led to an apprenticeship. And then from there, um, and this is at Long Beach Long Auditorium, Beach Auditorium and Arena. And so, where like back the, then, you know, all the big bands used oh, to go geez. through there. It was amazing. Yeah, it was the place to go. If yeah. you weren't eight thousand seats, everything was close. Oh, yeah. It was beautiful yeah. before the forum really hit it. Yeah, in stride. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the Long Beach Arena. I yeah. mean, uh, the uh, L.A. Arena too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sports arena. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, but um, so you you got this. Uh, you talk about the apprenticeship in in your book. Uh, what all did that involve? Did that lead you to become like a union member of I? I could have went to the union, okay, but I didn't because the the same road guys kept coming through, the same lighting guys, sound guys. You know, even the guys from Tycho Bray and Hermosa Beach and Shoko and um, Continental Lighting and all these different you know OB Lighting. All these companies were coming through, and um, you know I had learned at a young age to fix things especially from the union guys. They really taught me how to fix lighting, sound. So I really started fixing things. And so these bands would come through and say, hey, um, we have these lights at door. Can you work on them? So I started getting this reputation, and they kept coming through. So, you know, I was getting job offers, tour offers, but I was still in high school. And, you know, my father wasn't going to let me leave high yeah. school. You know, he, to them, school was everything. So um, I had that that opportunity to really learn not only about lighting and sound and it's just how a rock and roll tour worked and you know um and I just love the environment you know and again now I'm back at high school and I was on stage and with all these big bands and people are saying hey, how did you get on stage last yeah, night you're you know the cool kid. all of a sudden I'm a cool kid yeah you know I'm not a jock but I'm a, I'm one of the guys that so better than you know the jocks. I say you know when you when when you have relevance insecurity is merely a word yeah it's what it is so um and then it was so weird is, uh, you know, um, right after high school, you know, my father sat me down for my 18th birthday and gave me the paperwork to be a longshoreman. And I said, I don't need that. And he crushed him, you know, and he was upset and started screaming in Italian that, you know, I'm going to feed you for the rest of my life and this, mu you know, this music thing. And um, then I got a call to go on the tour. So that was and it. And before that, there was something that you did. I think it was March of 1975 at the Long Beach Arena. March 11th and 12th. That Led you Zeppelin. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So here you are. Are you? No, 17. you're out of school. At Seventeen. Okay. I got to work the show that you day. You got to yeah. work. Freaking. And I. Sad, but you didn't know. I mean, they weren't huge at that no, time. No, they were weren't. They? But the coolest thing was, is my guidance counselor let me. She wrote. She wrote a note to allow me to go work and miss class for both days. You know, what I mean, a nice guidance she, counselor. Yeah, she was. Well, her husband was the producer of Laughing. Oh, okay. the old uh -huh. Laughing shows. So she she knew. Where I was going with this. So, yeah, so I get there in the morning and it's like, you know, there they are. You know, back then it was three trucks. Oh my God, that was huge. You know, now there's 18, 20. And, um, I got to, yeah, I got to work the show and I was doing lighting. And, you know, I, you know, this the lighting guy said, yeah, we got to hang. These are really important lights. They, they're, they, they, they're on Robert Plant. You know, he's the lead singer. And I'm going, oh yeah, yeah cool. Not so, knowing. Not knowing. And the cool thing is I wrote in my book. So that day I finished doing the lighting and I'm sitting outside. Uh, right after the sound check and I was, you know, waiting for my father to pick me up to take me home to dinner. And I'm sitting here talking to this English guy, not knowing anything, you know, and, um, it was so funny because, you know, how was it like to live here? And this is why I love LA and I love California and everything and not thinking anything. So I go home, I eat dinner and I come back to the auditorium, the, the arena to work and, uh, I was lighting. So I, I had this job to hold the flashlight on the stairs. You know, so um, because the artist goes up, yeah, so the they artist don't goes trip, up and out, yeah. so they don't trip, right? So I'm, I'm lighting and, is and more than that. It was, yeah. <laughs> it's but not it's, just holding a flashlight, <laughs> but, 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 hey, but that was my but, job. Yeah, that's the cool part. <laughs> so you know, I'm sitting there, and it was just deafening. People screaming, and you know, you just it, your bones were like, you know, you felt it. You know? uh. All of a sudden, there's a tap on my head, and I look up, and the, the guy I was talking to is in his outfit holding a guitar. I'm going, oh man, it was Jimmy Page. Just like I didn't know. Wow. wow. So I sat like like right in front, you know, with the security guards looking up, and I realized, oh, there's my lights. I, I hung those. That's pretty cool. I did that, you know? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, that is great, so man. cool. But I mean, I can't even begin to tell how many shows I did. I mean, Humble Pie, the Pointer Sisters, the Beach Boys, Elvis. I mean, I did, I, did I, Elvis I, at the, yeah, oh at the auditorium. I mean, I, mean yeah. I, I did so many shows, I can't even remember. I think that was one of his last shows in, in Southern California, that one, at the Long Beach Arena, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was crazy. How many years were you there? Uh, 1972 to 1975. Three, yeah. So three-ish three years. Three years. Yeah. yeah, big years. Wow. I was 14 when I, when I tripped backstage. <laughs> that's incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, and Trip, then... Just yeah, accidentally just, I did, you know, yeah. and that's what it is. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was like going to college. Oh, well, yeah, it was learning a craft. Oh, my God, yes. You know, and, and little did you know that you could make money at it. It seemed to me that you just did it for the love of it. And then all of a sudden it was like, wow, I get paid for this too? I know. That's what happened after, you know, my first tour was The Who. And it was, I, I, I was like a 
a pimple on an elephant's butt on that tour. I mean, I was a lighting guy. I was first in, and I don't think, you know, those, those tours were so big back then, you didn't even know who was on the tour. But I could, I would do the lighting, and it was all follow spots. It was a really ingenious idea this guy had. Just a couple of big lights, but all follow spots. So it was like the first moving light show. Were and there I like had 15 a, of them or something? 26. 26? 20, uh, 24. I mean, yeah, that's a yeah, lot. Six on each guy. Oh, we, we drove around L.A. picking up every spotlight. And then when we did the show, my job was to run the cable. And, you know, back then, a 75 foot, there was no forklift. So, you well, know, that's what I was going to say. How did, wow. falls and how, how do you get that follow spot? We built big scaffold higher than it was. And then we you got to get it up, up there. with rope and pull it pulley, in. pulleys. Oh. So we put them up and we anchored them down and I run the power up and then I had to make sure they all had intercom and headsets. So And then you need a guy to run each one. It's yeah, not like union today guys where did, you union guys just... did that. But uh, during the show, so I would sit up on the up on the on the the staging up and I would just watch it. I was watching the Who. But during the day when I got done with the lighting, I would go on stage and just hang out and so my good friend who's no longer with us, Alan Rogan, that was Pete Townsend's guitar tech, he sort of befriended me and I would ask him questions. He was great. You know, this is how this works and you know, and then it was so funny later on in life I hired him to do tours for me. So it was really cool. So I, you know, I was learning a lot about that was like three and a half, four weeks up and down California just doing stadium shows. Wow. And that was your first big, that was my first big, big your tour. face paid, paid tour. Gig. And that's a funny part. So when I got, it was a lighting company, OB's Lighting. So when I, uh, when I went, the tour was over and I went back, they needed to, wanted me to come sign some paperwork. So they, I did and I was signing my tax forms and then the, 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 the secretary hands me a check. And back then, I think that was, it was like 4,500 bucks, which was a lot of money. Yeah. 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 And I just, whoa, well, made it. Wow. I didn't realize I get paid. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much fun. <laughs> Make that your own secret. <laughs> I, I was like, but you know, that's how much I was just, I was yeah. just into yeah. it. I mean, I had everything at home. You, you found know, your but, tribe. Yeah. You but know? you know, so the guys that were on the tour, uh, like David Cavelli, who used to work for Pacific Presentations. So I used to hang out at his house and stay. So I, you know, after that, the night before I went to the Who, it was the last night I ever spent in my house or my <laughs> with my parents. From then on, I was like, boom, gone. And what they think about you, like you're all of a sudden out my of the house. My mother always thought, you know, she got it. She said, you know what, I, he, I, I think he's going to be okay. My father was like, no, he didn't get it until years later until then he, he went to work. And I got caught in People Magazine with uh, Christine and John McVie. And his secretary showed him a picture of me in the magazine. Look, 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 Dino, look at your kid. And my dad's looking at it and... What is this? Your son's working for the biggest friggin' rock and roll band <laughs> yeah. in the world. Right. You know, he didn't get it. So he calls me up, says, hey, um, wh- what are you doing? And I said, why don't you come to the, to the Forum or the Hollywood Bowl, wherever it was, and come and see what I do. And then I showed him, and, you know, after that, he got it. Didn't you, like, understanding how they were raised and how you were raised and the fact that you got a scholarship to USC? I did. I got a scholarship uh, not only there. I actually... Before um, I went on tour with Who for a second, um, I went and lit Shakespeare at the prestigious LA City. Oh my God. Shakespeare festivals. So, and I really love that, but yeah. it just didn't. Yeah, no, I was getting scholarships, offers everywhere. So the, your dad just had to have been shaking his head like it's like. I never told him. Oh, okay. That's good. I never Ever? told him. Never. Yeah. yeah. That's good because he would have. Well, I mean, because you had uh, doctors and lawyers, uh, brothers and sisters. My brother was at USC at the time. Yeah. In fact, I lived at his fraternity for a second, which was cool. $60 a month, three meals a day, all you can eat. (laughs) College women. (laughs) Did you have to go through the initiation? No. (laughs) I just didn't fit in. I mean, you know, it's like Sesame Street. Which one doesn't belong? Are you you the hippie and the rest are the the preppies? It was all preppies. And then there's me with my long hair earrings with hockey jerseys. Yeah. (laughs) But you know what? Chicks dug it. <laughs> yeah. All that matters. <laughs> and you didn't have to go to class because your class was on the road. Yeah. So, yeah, it was uh, it was remarkable, you know? I mean. You talk a lot in the book about how life on the road, that became your family. Mm-hmm. And that's that's people who, you, I think the first year with Fleetwood Mac, you did, what was it, 200 and something? Yeah, two, we did 256 shows in a year. In a year. My Yeah, performances, God. shows. um and in that days, it was like load in, took all day. And I, I loved how you, in the book, you addressed how you would load in. You would. You know, lights came in first. Okay. And then the sound would come in, and then the band gear, and then, you know, um, 
it would it would layer itself in obviously because the lights had to go up so they're the first things in and then, and then sound came in wrapped around it and then the band gear and then on the way out it was the exact opposite exact so. opposite so you were literally the first one always there and the last to leave yeah and the guys were great i mean they they knew what they were doing but let's put it this way i think they were tour wise smarter than me so they knew that i liked to go in early so <laughs> they would let me do things that yeah. They didn't have to get up early because yeah. oh, I yeah. didn't mind going in first. And, you know, the other thing is, is I had a really good sense of how unions worked because I came from that world. So I would go in and, you know, and I felt I would lay the groundwork first and I would tell them, you know, and I knew how they were thinking and I would befriend them. And then so by the time the other guys got in, um, you know, they, the, the union guys were going, oh, these guys are pretty cool. They, you know, they're one of us, you know. And so, um, so, so we, it's not like we all had positions. We were de facto, we would just get in and get stuff done. I think there's this great quote that I heard once, um, that somebody actually made about us. And they said, you know what? You guys are great at a lot of things, but you're masters at getting stuff done. Oh, and that's that was, our, that, and that's mm. true. No matter what it took, the show went on. No, and, and, and we all pitched in and, and, and we didn't do it for money. You know, back then, you know, I think Ray Lindsay, the guitar tech, uh, who's one of the Knights of Rock is just wonderful. He said, you know, there were no lawyers telling us what to do. There were managers couldn't tell us what to do. They trusted us to make the show better. And mainly we did it because we didn't want to look like idiots. We all had this fear of having a nine to five job. Yeah. So we would strive to do anything to make ourselves relevant to make this world better, you know? It was great. But there must have been a lot of pressure going from town to town and you've got a time limit and it's got to be done. That those, that lighting has got to be up and ready because that show at eight o'clock, it's going on no matter what. So well, it, in those days, I guess it was a little bit. A little bit looser, but yeah. you know, you, you got to remember one thing. You know, a lot of the things that the people don't see in the general public is, you know, people. Oh, what's the worst thing that could happen if you're you're late or whatever it else? But you know, if you've ever seen a band not go on stage and see civil unrest with a hundred thousand people, <laughs> then you know the pressure that you have. Oh yeah. Um, so there is a lot of pressure. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of pressure, and the other thing is, is there's a lot of pressure to get it right so the bands put on good performances, and because it all reflects them. I mean, the outcome Everything. is is. So yeah, there's a, let me let me rear back a little bit because I you know this is something that John McVie taught me early on with Fleetwood Mac that I used when I was with the Beach Boys tour in the in the in the fiftieth. So we had these two factions of people. We had the Mike's band and, and Brian's band, and when I got out there, I noticed that there was this wall, you know, and it wasn't only because of the wife managers and everything. It was just a combination of a lot of I think misguided passion. So I pulled them all aside and I said, look, I'm the new guy and you guys can think I'm FOS, you know, you think I'm full of shit or whatever, but I'm going to tell you what this is, you know. And I remember John McVie said once, you know, you always got to try to do your best show because whatever it is, that person is paying to see you and you don't know what they do for a living. So if they're going to buy two tickets, buy a t-shirt, take the dinner, the parking and everything, that person might have worked a week in their life to honor to see you. So you better do the best job you can. So I took that into the Beach Boys thing, you know, literally 50 years later or 45 years later, whatever the hell it is. And I told these guys, I said, you know, you're doing a disservice not only to the band, which is a legendary band, but, you know, our tickets are now not $50. They're $350. The VIPs are 1000 So the bottom line is, guess what? Someone's spending at the minimum of $500, $600 to see us. And if we don't do what we, you know, then... We're doing a disservice to them, but to the legacy of what this really is. And, 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 and it's true and everybody believed it. And that's when it really started to turn. Everybody's going, okay, we get this, you know, and we understand this. It's true. These people are paying to see this band and this band is only good if you're good. You could be the best band in the world, but if the sound's horrible, you're not a good band. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That's the way it is. You're not a good band. Exactly. Or if the guitar is out of tune or something when you get handed to you. It's just not right. Yeah. Man. You the, know? the sound is off. I mean, it's like one of my favorites always to see was uh, Springsteen and the E Street Band. But, you know, up until a couple of years ago, it really just depended on the venue. It's like I, I saw little Steven at, I think, the one of the river shows when it kicked off in Pittsburgh. And, you know, I said, I can finally hear you. You know, it, he didn't really take to that really well. <laughs> But it was like, well, no, because it's... The truth, it's, the truth. It's, it's, it was the sound system. You know, and now the sound systems are so good that you can you can hear every little thing, every little nuance and stuff like that. But back then, you were at the mercy of who was mixing. You were at the mercy of the building. Analog. 
and the equipment. You know, you couldn't walk around with an iPad and tune your PA. You had yeah. to go up there with your ears and then, you know, if it sounded good here, it may not sound good there, you know? So it, it was, it's a, it's a completely different world. But again, you owe it to these people. I've seen what happens when the band doesn't go on on time or the band cancels, you know, we the riots. Ugh. Is this somewhere like in South America or in Europe, uh, the show that you're thinking about mm. where the, the audience didn't react well because the, the band didn't go on time? Oh, there's a lot of shows, but uh, <laughs> the one show that I know for sure that uh, was in Cleveland in 1978 when Lindsay had his epileptic fit and we were with the cars and somebody else and he couldn't go on and we were you know, and, and we, it's I, full. I it mean, it's full. A hundred, a hundred thousand people. Holy crap! God. And uh, they had sent the message out to the boards, and so I was out there. And uh, Trip Caliph, who was one of the sound guys, said, "Look, I've been through this. You don't want to. You don't want to be in the middle of this." So he goes, "Get off the tower, take your stage pass, clip it on somebody, and go backstage." You know, you don't, you don't, you don't want anybody to know that you're you're with the band. You know, because they will hurt you. We made an announcement that Lindsay was sick, and we even had a makeup date, and it still didn't. They tore up the place. They tipped over the trucks, the buses. Oh my God. It was crazy. It was mayhem. But, Cleveland you know, rocks. This is what people do, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, you know, I tell a great story in the book about 1978 when we were at Rich Stadium. And God bless JC, the tour manager for Fleetwood Mac, who's no longer with us. It was me and him and Wayne Cody, the security guard. And uh, I was sitting up against a truck, and JC had said, "Hey, let's do a the last, let's do a two to cocaine before we start." And as I'm looking over his shoulder, here come these New York State Rangers, and they bust us, and they throw oh. us against a truck, and they handcuff us, and they're, you know, and it was a not, it was not a little bottle. Uh-huh. You know, JC was like managing the band. Wayne was the head security guy, and here I was the production manager. And JC's JC's acting like a complete idiot. I mean, he's just like. You know, mimicking them and, you know, and I'm going like, you know, mm. I'm handcuffed going like, how's this going to look back home and <laughs> my parents and, you know, and Wayno's just, con- you. Wayno's telling JC, shut the fuck up. Uh, and, yeah. and then the cop just looks at JC and he says, hey man, he goes, you're pretty arrogant. You know, we can run you in. And he says, you're not going to do shit. Oh. And I'm going like, oh, God. We're going to die he goes, now. Well, what makes you think that? And JC says, I'll tell you why. Because there's 106,000 people here. I manage the band. He's the security guard. He's a production manager. Without us, that band doesn't go on. And he goes, and you better, if that band don't go on, you better get everybody you have because you're going to have the world's biggest riot this state has ever seen. And? And they started talking. And all of a sudden, they're huddling. And I'm looking at Wayno going, dude, are we going to get out of this? And they came over and they took the vial, put it on the ground, smashed it. And said, okay, you guys, you know what? We're going to watch you all the way to the state line. So you guys better, you know what? Watch her. So I went down to the stage. I told everybody, go to the bus. I don't care if it's an aspirin, flush it. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. But you know what? We got out of it because wow. it would have been, it would have been a complete riot. God. So, you know, now I'm again, at, I'm at the border with the Beach Boys crew. I decided to ride with the crew. And I told the drivers, do not go to Sweetgrass, North Dakota. It's where they train the custom agents in Canada. Huh. But Somehow I woke up in the morning and there we are, you know, and the buses, the dogs are going around the bus and they go to one bay and the dog goes nuclear. Ugh. I'm going, oh no, everybody off the bus. Okay. Whose bag is this? And a guy had a little pot left in his, left in his bag, his laundry bag. He didn't know it. So now it's like everybody get your passports and we're there and we're going to the Calgary Stampede, you know, 50,000 people. So I'm looking at the, now it's nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 1030. And so I said, if we don't get the one bus rolling with the riggers and the lighting guys by 11, we're going to have to cancel. I thought about JC. So I went to the head immigration guy. I said, listen, can we do this? There's 50,000 people waiting for us up there. And this is the Beach Boys, and it's the 50th, and it's the Stampede. I said, look, you got a bunch of guys here that didn't do anything. Let's get two buses, put them on, and let them go. I'll stay behind with the guy and the one bus, and you know, you can do what you want. And Well, we have another problem. He goes, there's two other guys. One guy uh, came into Canada illegally a month ago with another tour, so we have to hold him. And he goes, you have another guy that has an attempted murder out of Las Vegas, so he can't come in. <laughs> so I said, well, keep those guys here. Yeah. And the guy says, yeah, we can do that. We'll, we'll you know, because oh, wow. we don't want any unrest up in Calgary, right? So <laughs> all those guys got on two buses and left, because luckily the trucks went through earlier. We wouldn't have oh. really been hurt. Yeah. So the guy said, yeah, that's good. You, you know, you, you think you're, you, I like your thinking. So he, they went. 
I send get a rent a car and somehow get the other two guys to the next city. When I got to the gig, everybody was like, you know, the 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 rest of the band and they were going like, man, that's so cool how you pulled that off and what you did. And I was like thinking, you know, here I am, <laughs> you know, thinking about what happened in Buffalo right. in 1978. Right. God. But you know, again, it's the power that you do have. But you know, back then we didn't really abuse it. So it, it, it's interesting that how it, it all came around. You know, here I am using the same practices. So many questions to ask you. You talk about all that went into getting shows done, the production done to have a concert at night. And now with all the technology, is it easier or is it strip some of the um, purity? The thought process is different. I mean, back then, um, you didn't have the ability to use a lot of electronics and you sure as hell didn't have a lot of uh, uh, you know video walls and you had backdrops and everything and the band was more prevalent. The band was really the artistry. Now it seems when I go to shows, whoever has the most crap on the video wall wins and it's frustrating. Yeah. Technically, everything's easier. I mean, you know, you, you, you have smaller sound boxes. One small sound box does the job of eight of the old ones. One light used to have one color. Now one light has a zillion colors. Mm. So instead of 400 lights, you can do the same show with 40 lights. But back then, there was no OSHA. There was no rules and regulations. You know, we used to be able to walk around trusses without harnesses and... Hard hat. But, you know, it was the sharp yeah. knife, dull knife. If you had a dull knife, you didn't care, you know? And, and, and if you got cut, but if you had a sharp knife, you cared. So it's that principle now, I think, with the technology of it all. But, you know, they're coming up with new stuff every day. And I think, but at the end of the day, I don't care what anybody says... It starts with a song. If you don't have a good song and you don't have a good, you know, it's it, you can do whatever you want, but it, it's not going to translate. It, it's paper thin. It might last for a nanosecond. So you, you were talking in the book about how you began your association with Fleetwood Mac, mm. and you're at the SIR Studios right. in Hollywood, and they're just kind of rehearsing. But you hear some of the songs and you go, "Oh, oh my God!" So yeah, in 1975, um, they had brought a light rig to the West Coast, but they didn't bring any of the trussing or the lifts. So they had called the lighting company I was working with, and I went to like San Bernardino and some other places. So I saw the band in the middle of the 75 tour, and as they were they were gaining momentum because it was getting good with Lindsay and Stevie. That was like the, the first white, as they the called it, the album. Fleetwood, yeah. Mac Fleetwood, Mac, Fleetwood Mac. So um, I remember seeing them, but I didn't stick around for the shows because I was driving truck, too. So I would sleep during the show and then pick up the night drives, you know? So... Um, my friend Dave Oberman from Obi Lighting came down, and I had saw Obi come through Long Beach all the time. So Obi is one of the guys who said, "Hey, you're you know, if you ever need a job when you're out of school." So he called me one day and said, "Hey, um, the, after the Who tour, right after the Who tour, I said, you remember Fleetwood Mac?" I said, "Yeah, of course, I remember the old Fleetwood Mac from Long Beach." He goes, "Well, we have a chance to do a rehearsal. They're not going to go on tour right now, but they're rehearsing um for the of a new record they're making. But they also want to videotape the record label wants to videotape." some of the older songs to, you know, just to have in the can. So it's a it's a small rig, and it's at SIR. Do you want to do it? And I said, sure, why not? And he goes, well, there's only one thing. There's no money. He said, they have no money. And I want to do it because if we do it, then we can get the tour. And if we get the tour, there's money. Then, then, yeah. then you, you know, you could do it. Not thinking of anything other than, you know, and I, I got nothing else going on, and, you know, why not? You know, I never, I never, never did anything for money. It was like, it was one of those things. So I came in, and um, they had fired their old lighting designer, Curry, um, and they had another guy, and he didn't know what he was really doing. And he was a nice guy, but he was a drum roadie. He was a drum tech. And uh, so they, 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 we set everything up, and it was very apparent the band was huddling, and they were concerned. And um, so that day, they, they just said, well, let's, let's get Curry back. And there's a whole story behind Curry that you guys can read that I don't want to tell. It's about, you know, it has, it has to do with Christine McVie. And, so, and, um, and rumors and rumors and yeah, rumors yeah. that whole time, yeah. So um, Lindsay said, well, we're here. We might as well play some songs. So I was, I had set up my lighting, and I was sitting in a, like literally 10 feet from the stage, and they broke into uh, So Afraid. Now, So Afraid from the album, So Afraid Live yes. is night and day. And when they broke into it, I, I was like, oh, the energy and the, the, the connection between the five of them. 
the rhythm section in them. And I think Lindsay's style of guitar playing, that Travis picking, left a lot of room for Christine to lay the piano in. The rhythm section was always there. Yeah. So yeah. Lindsay wasn't this strumming crazy. He picked a lot. Yeah, that Travis picking style yeah, that we used to see. Yeah, he still does that a lot. Yeah. yeah he, he's great. He never uses a pick. Know, he's Lindsay yeah. Buckingham. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. So, but that allowed Chris to really lay the keys in. So you had the prominence of the rhythm section. You heard Christine's keyboards, and then you the way he played, and then Stevie just layered right mm. in with percussion and her vocal. And so I think the combination of what really happened between all of them made something that will never be recreated. You're not going to get a Christine McVie, John McVie, Mick Fleetwood, Stevie Nicks, and the way Lindsay produced it and played it to sound so good. And Stevie, of course, was magical. Christine had so much soul. And yeah. John and Mick are solid. Yeah. Oh, my God. One yeah. of the best so rhythm they sections played ever. It and, yeah. and he broke into the solo. And then, you know, I was like, it was it was frightening. It's like he goes you know? into a trance. I mean, I, I mean yeah. remember, I was watching like, you know, Humble Pie with Steve Marriott, who was just charismatic yeah. ever. And then Led Zeppelin doing Stairway to Heaven. And, you know, everything that came through yeah. Long Beach. When I saw that, I went, holy moly, this is insanely good. You know, and they had gotten so strong. And that was the first song they played. What other songs did they They practice? did Go Your Own Way. They did oh, Dreams. Yeah, they did same. Over My Head. They did ah. almost everything, you know. And so that night, Curry walks in. And Curry and I knew each other from, he was with Lone Star Lighting. So he was on the Humble Pie thing that, you know, he came through a Long Beach ah. a lot. So we knew each other. And I said, oh, my God, look at, you're the, you're the lighting designer, you know, because... And so we scribbled on a napkin what he wanted to do, and I we we made it work. And I went to the shop the next day and got some more stuff. And uh, the next thing you know, it's like, hey, we're going to do this tour, and would you like to do it? And you know, and I said, yeah, if Obi's doing it, I'll be glad to do it. And that was it. You know, started just that was my first Fleetwood Incredible. Mac tour. I was eighteen. So <laughs> twenty years on the road with Fleetwood Mac, and at the beginning, yeah, about you, twenty. You yeah. talk about like little auditoriums and stuff, and then county fairs and a year and a half. You're doing stadiums. Yep. And I'm sure that everything in that band just had to been magnified. I mean, everything that was going on personally <laughs> and then professionally to see, to hear your songs on the radio all the time, to go from these small little clubs, auditoriums to these huge places where you are headlining or, you yeah, know. Yeah. And there was a lot of adaptation that we had to do, you know, had to yeah. do when a band gets to the level that they got to quickly promo press. So, you know, a lot of people don't know. I mean, it's it's public knowledge that the song Tusk was actually a soundtrack, a sound check riff that we used to do years before Tusk was recorded. So we couldn't do sound checks anymore because the band had to go do promo and press. And plus the strength, the tie, you know, you don't want yeah. the girl, you don't want Stevie singing so mm -hmm. much on her voice. And mm -hmm. so what would happen was we would come in that, uh, and we would set everything up and try to get the levels from the night before wherever we were. But then right before the show would start, the band would come on stage, the house lights would go out and then Mick would play the drums and John would play the bass and then Lindsay would play a riff and then Chris would play and then they would, you know, and then when they had the levels out in the front of the house, they would say it in the headphones, okay, we're ready to go. And then Mick would do like one last drum roll, boom, 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 and then they started the set. Well, that riff that we used to use was Tusk, hmm. you know, so that's how Tusk was born. But during the year of the White Album, you know, we all heard all those rumor songs being built and being written and, and, and being, in fact, in the middle of the 1976 tour, we stopped for 10, 12 days in Miami to finish the record. They, they were doing solos and stuff, so... For all of us to, the crew got, you know, and we would walk into the studio and listen, and you just knew, you started seeing it come together, you know. Um, but like I said, I think, um, I call it magical animosity that they all had. That's a beautiful and way you know to what? put it. And, 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 yeah. and I don't, I hate to talk about it. I mean, you know, we all saw it, but it, it, it's, I, when I do my stuff, it's not like, I don't want, you go read what Lindsay and Stevie were doing. I want to tell you how me, a little kid from San Pedro, felt being so close to it. Yeah. Because it could have easily been you. But that's that's the the magic of I think what Fleet, Fleetwood Mac was. I think at the end of the day, the five of them are the only ones who really know the true story of really what happened. Sure. Yeah, everybody has an interpretation, and, and I've heard so many crazy things. Yeah, and and so have I, and it you know doesn't doesn't matter. There's a, another thing in the book that touched me, and I had somewhat the same experience on a smaller scale, and that was uh, the Mark and Brian show we had. Stevie and Mick was there and Lindsay. Yeah. And it's like seven thirty in the morning. Yeah. And she sings Landslide. Yeah. 
my God. I mean. And hit it. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was not a good start off of the morning because somebody forgot the coffee and somebody forgot the, yeah. the splint, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. So it was just like, okay, you, you wouldn't have known because that was one of the most amazing things that I've ever heard, that I've ever seen. And literally, I'm starting to cry. I'm looking at Brian and he's getting all choked up. And, yeah. and Mark's just like, oh my God. You had a similar kind of experience in a way. Uh, after being done with the show, I think you're in Atlanta. Yeah, it's actually the introduction in my book. So I wasn't even on tour with him. First of all, Stevie is just, people say she's a national treasure. I say she's a worldly treasure. Mm. You know, she's just as genuine and beautiful and talented as the first day I met her. And, you know, I, you know, I, I still see her every once in a while. And it's just, there's no words to explain what a great, great performer, person, yeah. everything that she is. So the story you're referring to is I was on tour with Billy Idol and, um, I had jumped off the tour bus and there were a bunch of kids with albums and stuff. And I immediately being, you know, arrogant as I was or whatever, I said, I'm sorry, girls, but Billy won't be signing autographs today. And they looked at me like I was from Mars. <laughs> Billy who? <laughs> right. And then I looked and yeah. I saw they were holding Stevie Nicks records and Fleetwood uh -huh. Mac records. And I said, wow, that's cool. So I went to the front desk and I said, is the Mac in town? And the girl goes, the Mac? I said, Fleetwood Mac? Oh, yeah, yeah. They're over at Phillips Arena. So I called my friend Marty, who took my job, and I told him, I said, you know, uh, he said, why don't you come down and say hello to everybody? And I said, you know, it's been a long, a long day, and I got some stuff I got to catch up on, give everybody my love. And then a text came in, and he said, no, you should come down. They know you're here, and I'd love to see you. And I think, you know, so I said, I'll, in my mind, I'm going, okay, I'm going to wait till the show starts, so I don't have to go to the awkwardness of being that guy yeah. backstage. And, oh, hi, how are you? Because you know, I used to hate that when I was a tour manager and people did that. So I waited till the show started and I saw Karen, Stevie's assistant, and she came up and said, oh, Stevie knows you're here. She really wants to say hello. So I said hello to everybody and I pulled this little case backstage because I was going to literally leave. And all of a sudden, Lindsay starts noodling, landslide, and I'm going, oh, man, here, you know, some things never change. And then she dedicated a landslide to me, which she had done a lot over the years, every time it was your birthday. And then she said, thank you for everything you did for us for all these years. And she said, first of all, she goes... You know, our tour manager, go-to guy, and she said something like, he's laughing backstage that we made it out of the 80s, you know, or something. <laughs> and um, But I tell you, that minute I started thinking yeah. about all the other guys that helped me yeah. get to all the things I did with that band. I just said, you know, this is this is where Knights of Rock really was, you know. And, um, yeah, it, it made me feel really good that I was being honored to, you know, by her. And But guilt. For all those times, it was like, you know, hey, it's Leo's 21st birthday, and here's Landslide to him. And so that really meant a lot to me. And, you know, so I saw her after the show, and I hugged her and just said, you, you sound great. You look great. And she was giving me the ins and outs of the tour and everything else. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, Landslide is always a special song to a lot mm -hmm. of people. I remember yeah. the first time I heard it, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, you know, how can you not, you know. It's well, just the best so songs ever written, yeah, I think. Passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, she wrote it in 1973 after a big fight with Lindsay up in Colorado. And she, she, you know, that was her way of yelling out, you know. And I say this in my shows and I say it in the book. Stevie and Christine empowered women. They taught women how to say no to men in a very, very through it's their true. lyrics, you know. And they were both going through tumultuous breakups and everything else. But women were latching onto those lyrics saying, it's okay for me to say F you. I don't like you. And there's a positive strong way to do it and those lyrics and those women gave women the power to stand up you know and i saw it we all saw it you yeah. know but people don't realize how much those women actually gave power to women it was it was interesting to watch yeah i mean when you look back at it historically there weren't really that many female artists i think linda ronstadt was doing and then hart late 70s but but fleetwood mac as far as the songwriting and you know the uh, making sure that they got credit you know, business-wise also. Their lyrics were, uh, like, you know, Linda was saying, Linda Ross said, you're no good, you're no good. And then Carly was saying, you're so vain. Carly, yeah. you know, Simon, you're so vain. But Stevie started saying, you know, you know, you have dreams for sale. And, yeah. and, and, and then all of a sudden it's like, you know, um, um, you know, rock on goldless woman, you know, that, that whole track, you know, but, you know, you start thinking about that whole situation of what they were doing in their lives. And, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy to think. It's amazing to me that it took 10 albums before Fleetwood Mac really hit the circuit, but it also took Lindsay and Stevie coming into the band. And you know what? To, the, to this day, that 
Buckingham Nicks has still not been released on CD. Right. They can't find the masters. Is that it? Yeah, you know, Ken Calais, my old partner from the record label when yeah. we were doing the KLOS stuff, we looked everywhere up and down. And I think they're politically, I think there's a lot of differences, but um, I, I think there's some two tracks, but I don't think no one, no one, no one's been able to find the master recordings from Polydor, I think. But, you know, we looked everywhere. I mean, we couldn't find them. Wow. Yeah, it's a great record, but, you know. It's a wonderful record. And just what, you know, what a There's a lot of references from that record that ended up in Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. But just, you know, how it was coincidence that they got to be in Fleetwood Mac anyway. And well, as originally, a, they didn't as a want, team. Just remember, though, yeah. originally they didn't want Stevie. Yeah, exactly. They only wanted yeah. Lindsay. Yeah. yeah. And then and Mick God had to do Lindsay some tap said, dance. Yeah. And then, you know, Lindsay, Lindsay said, it's we're a package yeah. deal, you know. And then. And thank God he said that. Yeah. And they met and. You know, and then when we first started doing the shows in 76, Stevie wouldn't come on till three songs into the set. Huh. So they would start with um, some blues track and then Station Man, and then she would walk on playing a tambourine and they would introduce her. So, mm. oh, a long way. so she was kind of a sidekick back then, do you think? No, I think it was a lot of it. It was because Stevie was a guy's name, Lindsay was a girl's name, Christine was in the band, and there was a lot of confusion on how they were going to introduce her. So they all come on stage together. Every You've got to remember the blues world was sitting back going like, well, what's this new stuff? And the, the new people were going back. like, what's the blues <laughs> stuff? And, you know, so one minute they're doing Oh Well, which is really blues, and they're doing right. rough shuffles. And then one song later, they break into Rhiannon. The, you know, and, and it wasn't only hard on the band to create that, you know, that contrast. I mean, you know, literally, I mean, there are two different styles of music. Now, you right. got to give it to Lindsay uh, and Stevie for coming in, but you got to give it to John and Mick and Chris Moore. They're a blues band that's right. with this new thing. And if it didn't work, what would happen to Fleetwood Mac? Right. Yeah. So it did work. But then all of a sudden, not only, but think about it. When you know, you're a blues band, you know, red, blue, green lights, small amps, you just play. Now all of a sudden you need more effects. You need more lights to get her persona down. So it was as hard on the crew as it was on the band to adapt to that new style. So it was a completely, it was like schizophrenic. And, you know, me and uh, Mark Drell, the front of house guy, were out there. And we used to take the heat from the blues people saying, what is this crap? And then the pop people coming up to the board going, we didn't pay to hear the blues, <laughs> you know? And, and so, you know, as the yeah. album took off, there were less blues songs. So, you know, it was interesting to watch that change, uh, you know? I remember seeing them at the, at the Day in the Green show, which I think you have. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, which the, one? The first the one with Peter Frampton? Yeah, or with Frampton. Headline? Yeah. And Gary Wright and UFO. The and, British Invasion. Yeah. Status Ryan quo. Auger. Yeah. It was, yeah. It, that was a, one of my very first concerts and it, they blew me away then. And I've seen them many other times. So I'm in Santa Barbara. Well, you know the whole story of that, right? At Day of the Green? Peter? Uh, I don't so know. So they weren't originally on the bill. I think Frampton was the camp comes alive was just faltering out, sort of done with its cycle. And they, had book two day on the greens. Right. They weren't selling as well. So Bill Graham being the smart guy that he said, man, let's put Fleetwood Mac on the bill. So we actually got to do a full set that day, which is unheard of for, for what was so-called an opener. opening act. I thought it was a bad move for Peter as good as he was. Fleetwood was at that time, mm. you know, and you got to remember now in between the day on the greens, we had to take our rig and go play LMU at the, the, the Gertson gym. So you had to tear it down, <laughs> go to the gymnasium with 1,500 people Ugh. and have 20,000 people on Manchester Boulevard trying to get in with a fire marshal telling us he's going to shut down the show because there was 1,000 people on the roof looking through the skylights. Oh, my God. Uh. Yeah. It was, oh, my God. And, you know, we, we, got, we got back to the hotel that night. We all sat at the, ho the, the old uh, airport park hotel by the Forum. Oh, yeah. And we all just sat back and did what road crews do. And we were going like, this is going to be one wild ride. You know, that's the night we really knew. And you had that many people trying to get in that building. It was crazy. And then three days later, we're back at the stadium. God. So they weren't back to back? Up. No, they were a week apart. Ah, mm. okay. Yep, the 25th of April and the 1st of May, 1st or 2nd of May. So we were, and in the middle, we did the little gym at LMU. They, we, did, we didn't want to cancel on LMU. We almost did. And of course, they wanted to move it to the forum and make course, money. Of course, and the band said, "No, we're gonna we're gonna hold our commitment and play that gym." It was crazy. <laughs> we're tearing apart speaker cabinets and lights, and we were just stuffing this crap into this little gym. What a great show, though! That's amazing. Great show. Do you have any any show that you've seen that it was like definitely one? I, you probably can't just have one. There's probably got to be a couple, no matter who the band or or the venue or where you were at, that you just went, "Wow!" Yeah. Uh, you probably had a few of those. A few, but there's one. Okay, so I'm touring with the great Al Jarreau, oh, jazz yeah. singer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, we were 1970, some eight or nine, I forget. I think it was early on. 
And uh, we were doing this little tour, um, and we pulled into George Washington University in St. Louis, and we played a church. Mm. It was really weird. It was this bigger church, and we had set up a the, – the promoter set up a stage, and there was uh, – you know, it was really small. Good band. Real stormy night. Crazy stormy. Thunder, lightning, everything. Two songs into the show, lightning, complete blackout. Trying to get whatever we can do. All of a sudden, I looked up as I'm, and and everybody had flashlights. So everybody in the in the venue had shined their flashlights on the stage. And Al Jarreau did the whole show a cappella with his band, with a piano and a couple of guitars, and guys banging on the stage, and did the whole show. And it was a Christmas show. And at the end, he broke into a Christmas song, and he picked up this little baby, and he was singing, and it was just unbelievable. It was pure talent, pure pure talent. Not one refund. Nothing. And it was just one of those moments where I just said, now. So again, forgot what tour I was on. I was walking from, it was Billy Idol. I was walking from the Ritz to Hellfest or whatever the venue was. <laughs> and uh, I walked through George Washington University and I see the church. Uh, mm. This is in 2015. And I walked into that church and I took a picture and I sent it to my good friend, Jerry Levin, who was the tour manager. I said, you know where this is? And he wrote back, he says, George Washington University. It was just, yeah, that was an amazing, amazing, amazing night. I'll never forget that. But there's all... Yeah. There's so many. There's so many. I mean, especially with Stevie. I mean, she had this weird way. She would conjure up weather. I mean, you know, you could have a perfectly uh, stormy night, and we had an outdoor show, and she broke into Rihanna, and it would stop, or it would start, or there was always... Me and the other guys on the crew, we're on the cruise ships, and we're talking, and we're going like, do you guys remember? Yeah, she always... She can always mess with the weather. <laughs> I was like, I don't know she did it, but she did. You were on the Belladonna tour? I was. And where, what was your role at that time? Production manager. Okay. Interesting. It wasn't really a big tour. A couple of dates, and then we uh, we did the uh, the Beverly Wilshire to film an HBO special. Oh, right. Oh. I remember that. I remember that special. Yeah. Great. Boy, that show. That's the night. She she just wasn't Stevie Nicks of Fleetwood Mac. She became Fleetwood Mac. She became Stevie Nicks. Yeah. She was a complete... You know, I write in my book, I say, you know... Those years I tend to forget because I always blended in with Fleetwood. But as I read it now, Stevie's solo career was, you know. And, but that night, that Belladonna show, and then the, the the HBO special came out, broke her to be Stevie Nicks. Yeah. yeah. Good band. I mean, A-line band. Waddy Wattel, mm -hmm. yeah, right? Waddy, Ben Montench, ben Roy wow. Benton, wow. Russ Kunkel Jeez. playing drums. Uh, Bob Glob was on bass, yeah. I think. Uh, Bobby Hall playing percussions oh my from God. Dylan's band. It was... A line, yeah. I mean, that really helped it. Yeah, yeah it was great. And Jimmy Iovine produced an amazing record, mm -hmm. you know. And they were dating at the time, weren't they? Or was that afterwards? No, I think they they started. I, I'm not sure. I think it was during the record cycle. Um, yeah, yeah. What a mini. <laughs> um, we're talking with Leo Rossi here in San Pedro. Uh, he's just released this book, "When the Devil Smiles, the Angels Frown." You have a uh, book signing upcoming yeah here we are we're doing this at my good friend warren's place at the parkhurst gallery on sixth street in san pedro that's a wonderful place uh some of the finest art that you know yeah, you're gonna find in southern california yeah. and uh yeah january 16th is the slated date right now i'm gonna do a small one and then i'm gonna probably do another one with a new performance that i'll put together and everything that we do uh is for charity um the book is actually owned uh, by a charity. The publisher is my son's charity. You know, I lost my son to cancer at 27, and um, he created some just amazing uh, nonprofits that help children living in extreme poverty. So everything that Knights of Rock does and everything, the books and everything are all for charity. These guys that I call all my old road friends, and they come on these ship. You know, I do a lot of cruise ships. And yeah, I do a lot of inspirational that, how you do stuff. That. So, yeah. Well, I did a show here in San Pedro to raise money for a school. And there were two people from Princess Cruises in the audience, and they said, would you like to do this on our ship? <sighs> Perfect. So I and said, what yeah. Is the, what is the show? The show is actually a – there's several shows. So the first show is called The Knight's Tale, which is my show of what I'm talking about right now, of how I came out of San Pedro, got into rock and roll, uh, the lifestyle with my kids, and then the ending of it all. And the, the message is – to use what you have to make the world a better place. The world's divided. There's a lot of anger, not only just in America, everywhere. And, um, you know, we all have to, we all have a responsibility and there's little things you can do that change the tumblers of time. 
and uh, so so that that that's my Knights Tale. And then I have Knights of Rock Fleetwood Mac, Knights of Rock Beach Boys, Knights of Rock Bette Midler, all these different tours. And I bring guys who are on tour with me out, and I have this whole um, edited version of Rare Assets, and we talk about you know the Fleetwood Mac, what it was like to be with them, and you know we were dreamers, and we helped them dream, and we made an impact. We didn't plan to, but we just did. So we tell everybody, you know, if you just teach a child to read, that child could become something. Sure. You know, so that's what it is. So we, we go on ships, we do keynotes, we do everything. And um, uh, it's all for charity. And most of the, you know, these guys, they'll fly out from all ends of the world and jump on these ships with me. They don't charge me a dime. You know, they get, we got, we, we don't, we don't get paid to be on the ships. We get to sell the books. Um, but, you know, um, we get to be with great people and tell our story. And, you know, and, and it's just, it's just been very rewarding. We've been blessed with our past. So, we're just trying to use it to pay it forward. And with all of you guys, you've got so many stories. Yeah, you know? did, and yeah. like like you kind of said earlier, it's like every different position's got a different way of looking at what happened through every tour and every incident. So And I'll throw stuff up like that, but then every once in a while I'll say, Okay, guys, now close your eyes and I'm gonna put something up on the screen and when it comes up, give me your first thought. And it'll be something that, you know, and they'll look and they'll say something and it spins off to a story. Yeah. You know, like I had this picture the other night we did on the ship. We were talking about uh, what it was like to be on the road and grow. And I have this picture of these two nice Halliburton suitcases sitting on the curb of an airport. And then there was these two laundry bags, <laughs> you know, of Fleetwood Mac laundry bags, you know. So I put it up and I said, what, you know, someone tell me about that picture. Well, the, the, the laundry was in the Halliburtons and the money was in the laundry bags. Ah. Because we knew that they weren't going to steal the laundry bags. <laughs> Smart. Wait, where else was the money hidden? Mattresses. Right. The tour bus? The tour yeah. bus mattresses. Yeah, that was, well, we started selling our own t-shirts and there were no credit cards. Right. So, the, the, so our, our merch guy, Ashley Roachclip, he would go around <laughs> with the truck drivers and pick up all the cash. And then at the end of the show, we're sitting there, you know, and it's a Friday night. So by you Friday, Saturday, Sunday, hundreds of thousands of dollars, nowhere to put it. So he had this idea to unzip our bus mattresses and we put all the cash in our mattresses. So by by Monday morning we're sleeping on a million dollars in our bunks because That's merchandising uh, it wasn't it did exist yeah exactly until like maybe mid late seventies yeah mid seventies like and, 76, 77 was the first time we did it and so it was like you had a couple of shirts out there and now it's like you know everything, everything. under the sun. But, you know, it, it, that's a whole new thing. And some, no, somebody had to watch over that, you know, so that position was created by somebody who was doing something else. And I'm sure as the tour expanded. Well, we finally got smart and went to the venues and said, count the money. And then we would give them the money and the venues would, we couldn't trust the promoters at the yeah. time. So the venue would write us a check. And then, then we, you know, so we started getting into that because it was, it was pretty dangerous, you know, to drive around with God, that kind of cash. Yes. So. Is it true that, that most artists, about 35% of their income comes from merchandising and stuff like that. I think nowadays, I mean, you know, it's funny because the way the whole music scene is approached, I think uh, merchandise is one of the first things. VIPs, so, uh, you know, yeah. the experience, and merchandise is such a huge line item. I think they think about that as a priority. And in fact, it's hard. I think when people approach music these days, they're looking at the trends of what's happening before the song. You used to write a song and market to the song. I think now they're looking at the trend and saying, write a song around the trend. It's a different, it's, it's swap because mm. it's all about YouTube. And, you know, if you look at yeah. the, 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 the Gen Zs right now, they're not watching TV, they're watching YouTube. So if there's a, something that's a vein that's hitting on YouTube and you have so much data that you can get, you'll write a song about what they're watching. And then this song translates, you know, but still it has to be a good song that's yeah. going to hit a nerve. So, you know, again, I think that's what's happening is, is we've, music has become numbers instead of notes. So they're looking at these trends and they're going, okay, so if there's, you know, a trend for banana trees, then write a song about a banana tree. And you'll, and it'll, you know, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, that's what, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. I mean, you, you could, there's a million great artists out there that can make songs. Yeah. But you know how you make a difference well and touring is where the money comes in now it used to be writing the song in record companies but now it's all oh, about yeah. the touring and the merchandise and the venues are crowded and they're you know people have a, yeah. don't have indisposable income so no. how are you gonna you know what i mean how are you gonna possibly find venue space yeah and then your tickets prices are so high if someone wants to see five shows a month they're gonna spend five thousand bucks people yeah. don't have that kind of money it doesn't seem like it, but yet it seems like shows are still selling out. Well, a lot of it is is uh, based by the scalpers, you know. I mean, the you know the StubHubs and the Vivid Seats and all these people of the world buy these seats up, 
And, you know, um, it's not a secret anymore. I mean, you know, the old days and even now, uh, we would come in in the morning and we would open the production kills on the side. So if the stage, yeah. you know, we would always hold the seats to the side. Right. But if they were usable seats in the morning, we would open them up and they would sell at face value. Um, I know when I was out with the Beach Boys, uh, the first two rows, I kept seeing sporadic openings of VIP seats. And no band wants to see empty seats in the no. first five rows. So I would ask the promoter, I'd say, can you give me the seat map? And what's going on? Oh, those were sold to StubHub. They're mm. VIPs. So VI- so they would sell them and sell them and sell them. And then four hours before the show, a $500 VIP seat would go for 25 bucks. Right. So what I would do was I would go up and take people in the back and fill in the front seats and then five minutes before the show, some guy says, you're in my seat, because he just bought the ticket literally 10 minutes ago and walks in. So the the, 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 the scalpers are buying, a, well, they're not scalpers anymore, they're part of the ticket scheme, right. but they're buying a lot of the tickets. And so I tell everybody, you know, look, if you want a really good ticket, wait to day of, because you can go online, you'll find good seats. And a lot, a lot of production money. seats come up because they've figured you out open up, right? where the lighting Especially is going to go. Especially stadiums. Yeah. Yeah, especially the stadiums. Yeah, they hold out a lot. Plus, I think a lot of a lot of times we see that if there's a show that's like, they're not sure if it's going to sell out or not, they might sell the back of the house first when they go on sale. And then all of a sudden, like later on, they're like, oh, we've just released a bunch of more seats and they're the good ones now. And so, it's a, it, there's a, it's difference, a big game when it comes to ticket sales. There's a difference between a concert and an event. If you look at Coachella and all that, you know, that's not even, the music is just the soundtrack for the event. It's what you're going to wear you know, who's going to be there? Where are you going to sit? Am I on social media? Yeah, where you can socialize. You know what I mean? That's exactly <laughs> what it's become. You know, now mm. I haven't toured since 2016. So it's changed a lot. But the last tours that I did, and when I did a lot of those big festivals, it was very apparent that it was nothing to do with the music. I mean, I think somebody told me last year's Coachella, there was only one band with guitars. I think it was Weezer. Everybody else was electronica or mm. something. So, I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems to be that's where it's going. Yeah. It's experience-based, you know, and... Which is okay. People want experiences. Yeah, know? but a lot of times you go and it's people that are on their phones the whole time or they're showing it live to someone that's not there or something. Like, I don't feel like people are in the moment, you know? Well, we used to go, we'd sit there. You just said it. We used to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You see, that wasn't our moment. But what they do is their moment. Right. And Absolutely. You know, that's their moment. That's what they do. That's what they're used to. They got to remember, they were two years old and their first toy wasn't a Barbie doll. It was an iPad. Yeah. So they're, that, that's their norm. So when you say, they, you know, so, so later on in life, when people are going to be able to telepathically talk between each other and not talk, they're going to say, oh, in the old days, they used to have iPads. Right. <laughs> you know? It, well, it's just the way the world's changing. Let me go back to the day on the green just for a, for a brief moment, because one of, the, one of the things that I was blown away, because it was one of my first concerts, but they had the vendors that were going up and down the aisles, but mm-hmm. they weren't selling the drinks, they were selling bongs. And I thought, <laughs> this is absolutely amazing. <laughs> this is where, talk about being in the moment, so... What happens? And a I lot bet of that, Fleetwood well, Mac. I'm sorry to say, probably didn't get a cut off the a, bongs. We didn't know what was happening, but again, you know, and then the minute someone gets busted, the promoters are going like, "I don't know anything about it," but you know, they did. Right? I mean, of course you know, they did. I mean, it, 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 again, well, you could go down, you could take your drugs down, and they could get tested down on the field to make sure they're legit. So, I mean, on one show. hand, you know, Bill Graham had it right. <laughs> well, he was a leader. Yeah, yeah, he was. He was yeah. a leader. So, yeah, it's interesting. Um, we're going to go back to uh, your charity, Knights of Rock. So Knights of Rock is just all these guys that you know. Let me tell you, Knights of Rock started. I used to have this beautiful house uh, up at uh, the point here in San Pedro, and it was an office. I think, uh, I'm not sure Mark or Brian, I think it was Mark came down once to see JR. So I used to have this house, and bands used to come there right, break up, fight. Uh, tour managers used to come into town. So... One day, I got a call from three or four tour managers that were all in town. And um, I said, yeah, come on up. You know, the house is open. And um, I catered it with a friend of mine. And I, I had I'd put this little cassette under the couch and just recorded the whole thing. The next day, I listened to it. And I went, oh, my God, this is like the real story of rock and roll right here. Mm. So my good friend, Mark Brickman, um, who's a lighting designer, you know, for Springsteen and Pink Floyd and everybody, I said, called Mark. And I said, dude, I think, you know, this has got some relevance. This is a pretty cool deal. I mean, you know, this this whole thing, you know. And um, so he said, yeah, this is. You, guys, you know, we, you know. So 
the first thing I decided to do was do a round table. So I took the theater up here and I, and I scheduled a dinner and I invited 10 guys and I didn't tell anybody who was coming. They thought they were just coming to dinner with me. Some of the guys haven't seen each other in years and each of them walked in and we literally sat and we filmed the whole thing. We had no plans to make it a documentary. No, we just wanted to see what it would feel. So I put Knights of Rock up on with a password and told all these guys, hey, you want to check something out cool? And we were talking about, you know, all our old days with Fleetwood Mac and Springsteen and, you know, all the bands, you know. And it, it was a really – it's and it's in fact, it's on the Knights of Rock site, one of the original roundtables. So – we all got busy with life and we let it go. And, um, you know, it, it was really funny because Cameron Crowe did roadies. Mm -hmm. Now, roadies yeah. didn't do well. No, it didn't. But somebody was searching and yeah. saw it and saw this is what should be out. And we all go, like, we don't want it that, you know. So after I got off the road and I was doing another business, and I finally decided I just didn't, you know, and I was getting more into the charitable work that was coming naturally. Um, I decided to do a Knights of Rock with Fleetwood Mac. So I got the original six road guys, and I didn't tell them. I said, you come to Pedro and have dinner with me and hang out. And then we all ended up over here at a little restaurant, and we filmed it. And um, it became just really cool. It was like, you know, we, you know we, 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 we owe it to tell people our story, but for a reason. So at that point, my son's charities were starting to take off, and the, the guys all knew about it. So... Um, I invited a friend of mine from Harbor College, Larry Heimgartner, who ran the theater department. And I said, Larry, do me a favor. If you can, write a script for this so we can do it live. So he sat through the whole thing. And about two weeks later, he calls me up. He says, Knights of Rock doesn't need a script. You just guys, you just get everybody yeah. and you just talk. And it, you guys are just the stories and the way you guys, it's like you guys, some of you guys haven't seen each other in 20 years and you didn't miss a lick. But then he came up to me and he said, but your story. He goes, the way those guys looked up to you and then, you know, I know your children and I'm, God, I just Googled your son, Ryan, and what an amazing, he goes, I think I want to do a story on you. And I said, eh. so he had done these, these 30, he's over 30 years, he's done these episodes called Our Worlds. And Our Worlds is Larry writes these things about poverty, HIV, women empowerment, uh, addiction, and he, these people go out and they do shows. So he said, I've never done one on hope and inspiration. This Knights of Rock thing is really cool, and i like to do one on you. And I still said no. And then he um, he says, well, do you have a book? And I said, yeah, I'm writing. I have my memoirs I've been writing over the years. I gave it to him. So about two weeks later, he comes back. He says, can you meet me? At so I did. And out walks this little kid, and he does my life. Oh, wow. And I was like, wow, mm. that's really cool. Uh, but it's wrong. But we can fix it. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the guy's really, I can help yeah. him. You go, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, 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 no. The guy ain't doing it. You need to do it. And I said, Larry, I told you. He said, it's not about fame or fortune. It's about you want your grandkids to hear from people say, your grandfather did some amazing things and he helped me through life. He goes, yeah, you. So at the same time, it's really weird. I'm sitting there and my daughter calls me up and she says, the funny thing happened last night. She goes, I was, why? I was at a bar and I look up at the TV and there you are with Fleetwood Mac. And I just started laughing. And all my friends were... Like, what are you laughing at? And then she said, I can't even explain it to you. I couldn't even explain it to him. She goes, Dad, you, you got to tell your story. I said, did you talk to Larry? She goes, no. <laughs> she goes, no, but you really do. I mean, what we've all been through and everything and losing Ryan, he, uh, I think it's time. I think, and I thought it was really weird that that happened. So Larry said, let's just do one school and see how it flows. And then I did one school over here locally. And the kids were just like, the teachers were just like, you don't understand. Kids don't sit still like this. And the show I did, the first one, is nothing like the one I'm doing now, mm. you know? And um, so I get a call from the teacher said, the kids want you to come to the class. And it was a writing class. And these pe these kids were just so inspired on that I was so close to these great writers. And so how did Stevie write? And God, Shaka Khan, she's my favorite. And God, she's so strong. And, and I started realizing that, boy, I can really make a difference. And then that and Knights of Rock came together. Mm. They, inter they intersected at the same time. And these guys are like, you know, some guys are into it. Some guys, hey, how much do I get paid? Yeah. No, no one gets paid. You know, if you don't want to do it, it's okay. We're not, we're not, not holding it against you. But, you know, everybody's stepped up. And, and, and Knights of Rock has become this beautiful nonprofit that we'll do whatever we can to use what we were blessed with to make this world better like we did in the 1970s and 80s, you know? Yeah. So some of them are still working. 
Like, I, think I just really. took my good friend Tim Lamb on this last cruise. He's still Jimmy Buffett's production manager. His brother Chris and I work for Fleetwood Mac forever. And to take Timmy, and Timmy's on the ship going, if any of you guys are ever at a Buffett show, find me and I'll give you a backstage tour. Wow. And people on the cruise line are just going That's like, yeah, we don't get this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. But Timmy's so generous to do that. And his stories of him and I being young. And then I brought Andre August. You remember Andre who was the tour manager for Dishwalla? Yeah. yeah. Talking about when he was the security guard for MWA. Oh, you know? God. <laughs> what a great story. Yeah. Oh, God. You know? I really didn't want that job. No, he had a great story. He said, you know, every day the local authorities would come in and tell him what the band can say and not say. So especially the song, you know, F the Police. Right. So he, was, he would say, he'd tell the band, you guys can't say it. But what he taught them to do was every time he had to say the F word, he would hold the, they would hold the microphone out in the crowd and let the crowd say it. <laughs> so works. you got your message across, yeah. but this was but the they genius. they weren't saying but it. But they weren't saying it. Yeah. So the authorities couldn't say anything. That's the so way. So I thought it was just so genius. And, yeah. But here he is telling insights like that. And then with Cher and Bon Jovi and Aerosmith and Prince and all the bands he's been well, wasn't with. Wasn't that kind of part of your job is always to find a way to, to make it happen and get around? No matter what. Right. CW, no matter what, that was our job. The show must go on, and you've got to figure out somehow you got to make it happen one way or another. So you're like a problem solver the whole time. But it gets deeper than that. So, well, of course. I was on a cruise before the book came out, and I was using these cruises to write a lot. So, 4 30 in the morning, I would go to the tail deck and at the back end, and I would write and watch the sunrise. And then I had my regimen of working out and everything else. I'm sitting there early one morning and this woman walks up to me and she says, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. I go, what's your name? She goes, Debbie. And I said, hi, Debbie. She goes, I saw your show last night. And she said, it's really amazing. She goes, but I'm a little pissed off. And I said, whoa. So no one's ever approached me like that. I said, well, sorry, but what happened? She says, you know, I I hear you talk about your son. She goes, I'm in that horrible club. I lost my son. Mm -hmm. And I said, well... I said, you know, and she goes, yeah, but that I'm really mad at my son. And I said, why? She goes, I look what your son did, and he didn't have a choice. And he could have done so much more. And I look at my son who overdosed, and he had a choice, and Uh he blew it. And I said, Debbie, you just can't, you can't go there, you know, with it. She goes, but here's the beautiful thing. She goes, I came on this cruise, and I'm not thinking about anything but just being with my family and your friends. And I saw what you did, and she goes, I just retired, and I'm trying to think of what I'm going to do with my life. And she goes, I know what it is. I said, what's that? She goes, I need to go out there and make sure no mother ever feels like I feel. I have to go help mothers with addicted children to get through. And and, and, and I said, well, if that's what you got out of it. That's why we were meant to be on this ship together. And my son wrote this thing called Just Love It. That's really, if you go to justloveit.org, you could see. So I later on, I gave her a poster of it. I said, hang it by your door and read it every day. But... These are just one of the endless stories that all of us on the cruise, I mean, all the guys get, you know, and you've given these people inspiration and hope on something that we were blessed to have. And, and, and that's, that's really, you know, what it's all about. It's not, it's definitely not about the money because there's no money there other than just us selling books. And again, you know, I got a way where it's not Simon Schuster. It's 20 K Watts. They own the book. Every dollar flows to the nonprofit. Right. So. It's it's a beautiful thing, and we get stories. People coming up all the time saying, "You know, God, you guys, you guys, you gave me, you know, you you revived my life. I had no idea. I forgot what it was like to be young, you know." So it's it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. I mean, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I mean, my life's so great right now. Every day, Saturday. Yeah, and you've had a wonderful life, and you've got these beautiful stories, these great stories. And you remember them all. You're still young enough to remember them all. Thank yeah, God. Some of them, you know, um, people ask me, you know, how do you remember them all? So I had all my itineraries and my books, and I used to throw them in a box. And luckily, my sister took them from my parents' house. So as I was going through and I would see something, a story kicked in, and endless phone calls with all the guys. Yeah. Hey, do you remember this? Yeah. And then I would collaborate with them um, to get some of this. There's a lot I forgot. I mean, you know, that they remembered, and there's a lot I remember they forgot. Um and I'm sure that some of them are, you know, this is my story. Some are probably not as accurate as maybe other people, but, you know, it, this is my story of what happened to me within yeah. that, you know. So um, that's a funny part when we go out. It's like we all have different versions of the story. It's the same message, but it's a different story. Yeah. I so. love the the hope and inspiration because some days it can just seem so dark, you know, in the, on this planet. You know, in this country, and, the whole planet, and like you said, Rita, you know, it's whole everything. World you know, it's divided. Yeah, you know, just that you can instill hope in somebody—that's such a blessing. 
you know. Yeah, and just you know yeah. what we were blessed with to take it there, you know yeah. what I mean? And it's like I'm telling you, it's it's especially you know, you go to keynotes and some people say, Can you teach my management people to think outside the box like you guys yeah. did? And the first thing I say is don't ever do anything for money. If you're gonna do something for money, it's usually wrong. It'll come to you if you just do the right thing, you know? The worst feeling in the world is waking up with apprehension of did I do the right thing? And you all know the difference you're right or wrong. And if you feel it's wrong, search your soul, man. You know, because I'm telling you, that's the, there's so, you know, and you know what? The greed is caused by fear. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in Germany in the last tour and I was in Leipzig, which was used to be East Germany. And there was this el elderly waitress and we were talking to bartender, barmaid. And she, I said, so you were here when it was East Germany. And she said, yeah. I said, so what's the difference? And you know what she told me? She said, I love my freedom. I can do what I want. She goes, but when we was communists and we got to a certain age, we had housing, we had food, we knew what we were going to get. She goes, my biggest fear right now is I'm going to be working in this bar to the day I die. And you think about messages like that, yeah. you know, when people don't know if they're going to be able to support themselves later in life or they're going to leave something for their children or when, you know, when th that fear comes in, people get desperate, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and that, that, that's a lot of what's happening is just this fear, this underlying fear of who's going to take care of me. Mm -hmm. So it's sad. But yeah, wow. Going through the book, I, like I said, I haven't finished it yet, but I'm so enjoying it. Thanks. But there is, there's one point in there where, I mean, you've been around all these people. Hmm? I mean, some amazing names that people would be jealous, you know, of the time that you spent with, like, say, Stevie Nicks or Lindsey Buckingham or Pete Townsend, Keith Moon, all these people, all these great rock icons. But you said once you were starstruck. George Harrison. Yeah. I was over in 1981. I was with uh, Christopher Cross, and Mick had just gotten back from doing his visitor record, and we ended up at uh, this hotel. We all stayed at the same hotel. I forgot the name of it, and I happened to be there, and Tony Tadero, who was Mick's drum tech, was there, and uh, we were obviously paisans, so we were hanging out. We took a train to Fry Park to pick up some stuff at George's place, and he wasn't there, and then when I came back to the studio that was owned by Jimmy Page, they were tracking a song called Walk, Walk a Thin Line. And um, I was sitting in the control room and they were, and it was dark, but all of a sudden I heard the guitar and I went to Tony, I said, wow, that's George Harrison because you get the signature sound. Mm. And um, sure enough, I went, wow. And then he walked out of the control room and Mick and him used to be brother-in-laws. You know, he was married oh, to Jenny. Patty and Jenny was, yeah. so they were brother-in-law. So they, they, oh, they, that's right, yeah. So Mick, just said, Hey, yeah, this is, you know, you know, Tony, this is Leo. He's one of our long, long time crew. And yeah, I was really like, wow, you know, um, cause I had met, you know, a lot of them, but you know, and you know, like I didn't, uh, hi Pete from across the stage. We weren't pals. I was a, I was a lighting guy on a crew, but I was, you know, but I couldn't take my my, my eyes off of Keith Moon. But later on in life, as I became a tour manager, of course we got more. I had to get more yeah. intimate with the artists, as you know. And the Bette Midler tour was amazing. I mean, that was a that was a cultural changing tour of gay Hollywood meeting rock and roll and mm. AIDS creeping into the music business. So when you start getting in a position where you're tour managing and you know more, you're gonna be very very tight with those artists and see things that nobody gets to see. But again, it's like I, you said, I look at all these moments and realize that these common normal days for me were only days that others could dream about. But I, I say it, they were given to me for a reason, you know, and that's to use it to make the world better. Yeah. And that's just it. You I know? love and, that you're doing that. Yeah. And it's really, really, um, it's great, you know, and I just absolutely, I've been, you know, been blessed. And God, my friends that I toured with, they all step up and they're just there and they don't ask me for anything, but they love coming out and telling their stories, you know. Yeah, it's it's just, I, I, I couldn't ask for anything more. Where can people find out more about the charity? 20K Watts, 20K, W A T T S dot org. My son Ryan um, was a professional soccer player, and when he stopped that, he was working with J.R. Richards from Dishwalla. He was in a band with J.R., and then he started his own record. We went to Central America to play for the Peace Corps, and they found out that children live in extreme poverty. Things that we take for granted, water, mm -hmm. light, light mm -hmm. bulbs, um, these kids don't have. So um, he committed himself to get rid of kerosene lamps with solar, water filters, and help these children with medicine, books, anything he could. Um, and the one thing that's great about 20K Watts is, you know, one time Ryan said to me, because I had this whole plan put together, he says, no. 
He says, this thing has to be judged by its actions, not by its hype. He says, we'll, we'll make it when we're able to say no to Oprah. You know, that's when you know you have a good charity. Yeah. So we don't do any Facebook. We don't do any Instagram, nothing. We're judged by our actions. So the thing is, I got tired of asking people for donations. And the same guys would always step up. Here's $1,000. Here's $500. Here's, But I felt like, okay, you know, so these last two years, I sort of put the charity on ice a little bit, and I created this. So now there's money coming into the charity. So we don't that's have to depend book. on anybody. Yeah, the book. Yeah, yeah. sorry. For those of you who can't, can't see us, yeah, <laughs> the book, you know. So again, that's what the charity's doing, and you know, um, so recently I got an email uh, last Friday. There was this little, this little young man at 14 years old. His name was Edwin, and he was from El Salvador, and he was in a very, very, very harsh place in El Salvador called Chachulapa, which is gang ridden, no water. So Jr. and Ryan uh, befriended him and gave him a guitar. And Ryan used to say, well, Edwin, when you're down, just play guitar. We gave him solar lamps so he could study. So I get an email from Bree, who's on our board, who was one of the Peace Corps members. We've been invited to a groundbreaking. I said, in El Salvador. When? Last weekend of January. Go, who is it? It's Edwin. Wow. He's now 22. Oh. He graduated from college early. He got into the city council. Mm. And he made a deal with the Japanese government to drill a well in exchange for giving them coffee. Hmm. So now the whole region has water. And he says, I thank these crazy guys that came and brought me light and gave me hope and gave me inspiration. Yeah. And he's paying and, it forward, you know, too. And, and, and you're seeing, yeah. you know, this, he, you know, you're seeing the ramifications yeah. of what you're doing and the power of what you're doing. And it's like, oh, okay. And, and, and they said, wait till you get down here. There's more. You know, if you go on the website, there's stories about how we've helped uh, different areas uh, about uh, women hygiene and health. And uh, uh, we've built, um, you know, this one orphanage said, we're going to build a food shed to store our food because I told them, I said, your food's getting ruined by the weather. So I gave them, uh, we raised $7,500 and I gave them, and it's not a food shed, it's a full-on building wow. with silos and tile. And, and then there was another one that kept asking us for money to, for their power bill. So we gave them $1,500, and then we gave them some more, and they had built a hostel. They're right across the street from one of the best surf breaks in the world. Mm -hmm. So I met them from the surfers. You say, we're going to go play with the kids at the orphanage. So now they have this hostel they built. They rent it to the surfers for $20 a night. They, they come down there, they surf, they pay. So now they can support themselves. Wow. There's no more donations. That's beautiful. So I love these that. are the things that started to happen. So yeah. I can't wait for the groundbreaking. Yeah. But, you know, we've given away hundreds, thousands of solar lights, you know, and water filters. And so, it, yeah, it's been, it's, and, and you know, and, and again, I don't want to say too much because when you get to see my performances, you'll see why my son did what he did before he passed. It's a really interesting story. Yeah, and we'll put all the information up on our um, website. And he was talented too. I enjoyed some the great songs, that songs. You played. Yeah. yeah, in fact, I talked. You know, um, he was in the middle of his record eight years ago when he passed, and uh, Jr. and I were talking. And I, you know, we put out that last Dishwalla record, and it sort of just went away. So I, I actually sold it to Jr. for, and he's going to re-release it. And uh, he said, "Hey, I'm going to finish Ryan's record." Oh, and I wow. said, "Oh, wow, that's cool." Mm, so that's I can, cool. You know, that's, so that's going to be great. Really exciting. Yeah. So tell us the different books because obviously I bought, <laughs> I went to Amazon and bought your book, Leo, and uh, yeah. I was reading the pictures, and they said, Sorry, "Look at the man. color parts," and I'm looking, and all the pictures are in black and white, and I got very confused, being right. ADD. I'm sorry, so, man. So uh, tell me. So okay, if, so here's the deal. Also. Amazon, <laughs> yeah. uh, Amazon, Amazon has a black and white version of the book because I can't sell color through Amazon because the book's too long to print color on Amazon. So um, the new version that's coming out on Amazon, which will be in the month, it has the corrections. I corrected all the version two. Uh, I but corrected it'll all the subtitles. But it will still be in black and white. It will still be in black and white. But if we go to Barnes & Noble? If you go to Barnes & Noble, you can order the color. Okay. And um, you'll soon be able to order the deluxe version, which is an eight and a half by 11, which is really a coffee table style. Beautiful. It looks really nice. And if you go to leosbook.com, you can order a color paperback. Okay. And I'll ship it to you. And if in the instructions box, you put your name or who do you want it signed to, I will sign the book. That's awesome. So that's beautiful. Leosbook.com is probably, and there's, it's out on Kindle. That's where I got mine. Um, so you can get Kindle, and uh, which is good because that's color and uh, the captions are working. And then soon <laughs> to be on Apple uh, iBooks, which oh, is really going to be tremendous because when you click on a picture, you're going to be able to go to a YouTube video of exactly what oh, I saw. Oh my God. That's your kid. And I have some music in there, um, and I have uh, I have interviews of the guys. So, and there's one thing cool. There's a page on the iTunes book that every month will refresh with new content. 
Wow. I so love you that. can go back and the book will yeah. be evergreen. So that's going to hopefully come out uh, by February. There's a lot of legal issues with that. Uh, You're getting music rights, I right? I am getting music rights. And uh, there are only a couple of tracks from Fleetwood Mac. And the band, the, the band's been great, mainly Christine McVie songs. So um, she's been really, really gracious. And, um, you know. It's just the legal problems, right? No, it's not even no? legal. It's just a matter of, uh, it's just wading through um, the, the, the procedure of who, you know, everyone wants to cover their butt. Oh, okay. Even though, you know, she says, okay, if I do this, am I, am I jeopardizing my job? You know, so it's just procedures. It's, you know, right. until you get it all down. But, okay. You know, like I said, I tried to reach out to everybody I could where I had the photos. A lot of them are mine. A lot of them are Neil Preston's, but there, I'm sure there's some. I reach out. If you own this photo, please contact me. But again, if you see a photo in there that's yours, contact me and I'll be glad to pay you. And if you want to sue the nonprofit, God bless. <laughs> <laughs> less lights and less water <laughs> for right. El Salvador. It's like it's not that big of a deal. Away from those God. People. You know, and yeah. I've been approached about uh, uh, a screenplay and I said, you know, I just not, I'm not there in my life. And the newest show I'm actually working on, which is cool for the ships and for is um, taking the cross between the book and my show now, and I'm interacting with people on a screen. So if it's my teacher from the old days, there's a picture of him with mm-hmm. the voiceover of him talking to me, and I'm going to answer him back. Oh, it's perfect. almost like Billy Crystal's 700 Sundays, if you haven't seen that. Tremendous. Okay. So it's something like that. So, And I'm going to do that with the other guys. So, you know, I, oh. I, I have a goal to write a book about the early years of Fleetwood Mac with all of us as authors. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's great. great. <laughs> yeah. So that would be fun. All right, we're almost to the bonus round, but I wanted to know, as a roadie, were there any kind of initiations as a roadie or from the band? We've heard so many different stories. Well, first of all, we hate the word roadie. Okay. Because well, roadie has a connotation of some junk, drunk English guy that was a friend of the band. It's road crew or tech. Okay. Techie. Okay. Tech, it's techie. Like, like me calling you a jockey. Well, I was never a jockey. Well, I wasn't either there you <laughs> sports go. related you know, or on go. air. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a grunt. was there initiations yes. from the bands? Yes. Yeah, and there were initiations from the crew. There's a great initiation story in my book of what they did to me. Okay. Bastards. Give me a give us a small taste. Well, they figured I was 18 and I wasn't. Oh, I remember grasping okay. the full grip of rock and roll, sex, drugs, and rock yes. and roll. So, um. They initiated me by um, making me a man overnight. You got to read it. No, I did read it. I, it you now to came him? to me. Yeah. Yes. This is a young lady in the hotel room. She wasn't I young. was thinking about well, the story when they took your luggage and threw it off the... I still have the blanket. Okay, good. I was going to ask about that. that. I, I, I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know what? That does, that's a moment that changed my life. Because if I would have reacted, got mad, yep. or uh, you know, I just would have been roadkill. Yep. Okay, next guy. Yeah. I just... Took yeah. a hit a joint, took a sip of beer, did a line of blow, and I was one of them. Yeah. You know, I was young, you know, but so that was a really a moment. But um, I think um, there wasn't really initiation as much as it was, a, are you in or out? Uh, the initiation really came when they did, they, they she was an older woman and they set me up and um, I <laughs> thought I like did it all on my it. own, you know. And it's then, too bad they blew it for you. <laughs> I was a man. I was 10 feet off the ground. Okay, I'm in. I'm all in on this now. All night. That yeah. night I learned more about the <laughs> drugs and the female anatomy uh, and everything. That she night was a was teacher. Yeah. Was it? yeah, she did. She taught she me taught. well. Uh, and, but again, see? I walked on the stage and there were all my brothers at the top of the stairs looking at me and going like, Who we were you know. last night? <laughs> <laughs> we know where you were, Leo. Yeah, they did. Sex and drugs and Yeah. Game. Well, the funny part is when she asked me, so you want to go upstairs? And I looked there, I go, what for? <laughs> I was so young, man. <laughs> what for? That's great. Uh, oh, that. Uh, more. <laughs> exactly. What would you today say to your 18-year-old self? Wow. That's a good question. I think I would say you're going to have a good life. Don't worry about it. Yeah. No. That's what I would say to myself. If I was, you know, not too long ago, I had a dream about me talking to my younger self, but I wasn't sure if it was my younger self talking to me or my me talking to my younger self. It was really weird. But um, I would say to myself, man, don't worry about it. You're going to have a great life. Just love it. Beautiful. All right. It's time for the bonus round. Ready. Speed round. It's just like uh, Price is Right, but with questions. Huh? Um, what was your favorite concert that you attended? Many, but I think uh, Us Festival '82 was good. Fleetwood Mac, Us Festival. You were working 82. that out then. I was also. working that. And that was the yeah. 
was the best show that you never worked that you saw? Roger Waters, The Wall. Which one? This last one. Oh, God, it was amazing. Crazy. Yeah. I, mean, I agree. 2000, fact, whatever it was, 12? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. By uh, far. I went to go see my good friend, Trip Califf, who was mixing sound. He said, I just went to say hello, I have dinner. I sat at the board for three minutes and I could not move. Yeah, it was phenomenal. I'm actually editing as we speak. We interviewed Kip Lennon, who was part of Venice, who did the background <laughs> vocals. Yep. And uh, he's just talking about, and he's giving some great stories about working with Roger. And it's just like, I remember that show. And I, I kept thinking to myself, you know, this is one of the very best shows I've ever seen. It's so... That's so Roger, though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. God, it was great. The sound, the sets, the just everything. everything. God, the first three minutes, they did more than most bands would do in a year. Right. It's crazy. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. If you were making a documentary film, what rock subject would it be on? Technology. Yeah? How it's changed. In the whole history? Yeah. Because I was involved in that. And I'm going to write that story. Are you? Yeah. Is that in book two? Three? Book three, which is actually book two in my life. This is going to be like Star Wars. It's all going to come no, out. No, no, it's only three books. I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, the, the <laughs> cent- order, though. The center, part of my, the center part of my life after I left Fleetwood Mac is where I started the record label and did all the, the technology stuff when I really knew you guys. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is 2006, 2016, which was touring. So I'm going to write that first and then go back to the middle section. But uh, how technology uh, really changed not only the music industry, but just cultural period. Yeah. Really interesting story. Okay. Craziest thing that ever happened on tour? Craziest thing that ever happened on tour? The chicken story in San Francisco. (laughs) You got (laughs) to. You got to tell it. 1979, um, <laughs> JC was the tour manager for Fleetwood Mac, and uh, he started off uh, his life as uh, working in a poultry plant, so he had this fear of chickens. So Don Fox, who was the promoter from Beaver Productions that we did a whole tour with, they used to play pranks with each other all year long. Well, this was in, uh, December 1979. We were just winding down the Tusk tour, actually starting the Tusk tour, and... Um, Ray Compton, who was the promoter rep, was a dear friend of ours. And the Knights of Rock, unfortunately, Ray passed away too. Um, they had an idea. So they went into Chinatown and they bought eight crates of live chickens. And they put feed corn and hay. And they put these chickens in JC's room. <laughs> so they did this during the sound check. So it was a two-night stay. So after that, we all went back to our hotel. And we were told there was a party. And we had came back, and there were hundreds of chickens at the Five Star St. Francis Hotel. Uh, and we had this party, and then the guy started throwing chickens into the elevators. <laughs> and then there were chickens all over Union Square. Dennis Wilson was there with Christine McVie. Dennis was going to throw a chicken out the window until someone said, Dennis, chickens don't fly. Um, so... It was a, it's one of the greatest classic rock stories ever. <laughs> we got thrown out of the hotel the next day. Can't um, imagine why or how it smelled. <laughs> and, and, and so the funny part is, is not too long ago, I went back to the St. Francis looking for the bellman and he wasn't there, but I talked to him on the phone. Oh, wow. Uh, and he really? said, you guys made the place look like a ranch. He goes, you should talk to the head housekeeper. She's still there. And he goes, did you guys know we had to shut the whole hotel down next day for Santa? We had to clean it. Oh, my God. So we would never be able to do that these this day. Uh-huh. We'd be arrested no. and PETA and everything else. But uh, it was a great uh, – there were chickens everywhere all over San Francisco <laughs> running wild. <laughs> it's the greatest – one of the greatest rock stories ever. Uh, that's beautiful. <laughs> yep. Um, it's in the book. <laughs> it's I haven't gotten to that part. So, But just when you said involving the chicken, I knew I was going to enjoy it. <laughs> What is your coolest piece of tour memorabilia? A video of Brian Wilson singing me happy birthday. Oh, wow. In a dressing room. Mm. Jeff Fosquet and him, he said, hey, Brian, it's Leo's birthday. I have great memorabilia, but that is my favorite piece of memorabilia. Brian singing me happy birthday. That's cool. And how about what is is your biggest or best spinal tap moment? Wow. Spinal tap moment. It's a hard one. I'm trying to think when it comes right to the top of my head. I think the rented airplane to Australia in 1977. <laughs> okay. I know what happened. In 1977, uh, um, the band was, the Fleetwood Mac was invited to play Australia and Japan. And uh, we had to think of a find a way to get our gear down there. Uh, air freight, normal air freight was too expensive. Taking ships was too long. So we had a friend that uh, was a pilot for Air America. And he had found a DC-8 cargo jet that we had chartered through our consolidated, our freight company. 
And um, we found a way to pack up. The band only would do it if they were able to take their sound lights and band gear and everything by themselves. They wanted to. They didn't think there was enough good gear down there to do the right show. So we packed up our sound, our lights, our band gear, and we stuffed it into this DC-8. And um, we flew multiple stops to get to to Australia. While the gear was in trucks in Australia, we subleased the plane to a cattle company that was flying <laughs> cattle between Sydney and India. And they did as many runs as they could so we could, you know. And then um, when we got the plane back, we were flying from Sydney to Auckland. And then we were going to do two shows in New Zealand and then fly to Japan. And when we got the plane back, um, they cleaned it, but they didn't after clean the, the cattle after the cows. Runs. After the cow uh-huh. runs, they cleaned the plane, but they didn't clean all the air ducts. So it was really bad. It was really, really bad. It was <laughs> like, like, what do we get ourselves into? But then when we were flying from Australia to Japan... I had crawled all the way up through the cargo to talk to the pilots, and we had a mechanical issue with some fuel and some engine problem. So we put the plane down at Ward Airfield in Port Moresby, New Guinea, to get repairs and get. Uh, and we were partying with uh, the mudmen that came out of the hill with spears and loins cloths, and who you were told not to talk to, we were right? Told not to talk to them, but of course, don't ever tell a rock and roll road crew to do <laughs> nothing. And so. Um, we got something to smoke. We weren't sure it was pot, but whatever it was is good. From and them? We, yeah. And then we gave them got drinks. The weed. And we got We don't know if it was weed. We don't know what it was, but it was good. <laughs> well, what we did it do? It, 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 it was like a cross between marijuana and Coke. It was like uh, you X. Speed it but up you speed mellow? I don't know what it was, but it was good. And then we were giving them drinks, and they had never tasted Coca-Cola and you know oh, Bloody wow. Marys. and So it was this cool cultural exchange between the Rock and Roll Road Crew and the Mud Men. And we traded T-shirts for spears and masks, and which we all still have. And they're all running around with Fleetwood Mac shirts on? It was funny, man. It was great. I mean, it wasn't the normal airport. It was this long airfield that the Navy used to own because it was a big jet, you know? Yeah. So um, it, it was God, there was The fuel. whole tour was Spinal Tap. And this thing was like, okay, when, you know, you, we were pallet 16, about bolted airline chairs in the back and when this thing took off it wasn't like it was a it was like full thrust pop the brakes shaking oil smells mm. it was Ugh. like this is the you know you could it was it was spinal tap <laughs> wow yeah we called it pallet 16 we nicknamed the plane malolo which meant flying fish in hawaiian <laughs> <laughs> at least you didn't have to skim off the water <laughs> it was exciting uh, well congratulations great. you win a prize this is a 1977 original Phil Graham Fleetwood Mac belt buckle. Oh, my God. Wow. I have one of these. You do but already? thank you. Well, This is wonderful, man. Now you have bookends. No. This is absolutely wonderful. Oh, my God. CW. So Mine's not in good shape like this. Well, that's still a little worn down, but... Oh, man. This is wonderful. We can't wonderful. get picky with our prizes and our budget. Trust me. No. This is like... You know what? I'll find a nice leather belt and I'll wear this when I do my Fleetwood Mac show and I'll tell everybody, look what I just got. That's right. You want it. Tell me you want it from a carny. <laughs> from a jockey. <laughs> from a, a jockey. jockey. It's wonderful. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Leo. Oh, that is so awesome. Yeah. Sorry, Reed. I didn't give you one. Damn it. I know. I'll have to wait. Yeah. But it's yeah. got the penguin on it and everything. Yeah. The penguin. That's beautiful. The good old penguin. The inflatable penguin that got uh, away. Yes. Well, the book again is When the Devil Smiles, the Angels yeah, Frown. When the Devil Smiles, the Angels Frown, my life and times in rock and roll. Leo Rossi. So, Leo, thank you very much. Thank you guys for thank coming so down. Much. And, uh, man, it's so good to see you. You too. And Our I pleasure. Told you, you know, every, you know I'm a, JR says say hello. Everybody says hello. We miss you guys. And I'm so happy you're doing this. Yeah. And I'm just so happy that, that you've found a way to put your passion of music towards the greater good. And, yeah, we're uh, doing some cruises. Um, February 15th, 22nd, March 7th, March 12th, I mean March 7th, March 15th, and March 29th, I think, on Princess. Okay. It's the Royal Princess. They're Mexico cruises. They're Knights of Rock cruises. Well, we're going to do multiple episodes. I'm going to try to bring some of the guys. So uh, if anybody wants, they can go on Princess Cruises and look, but it's uh, it's it's Knights of Rock. And you, you do know? them throughout the year, right? Yeah. So yeah. even after, after these, they'll probably be more down the line. Yeah, I mean, um, we do some California Coastals. We did a little four-day Catalina run. I mean, whenever they need me, we'll just go do them. Like I yeah. said, we just sell the books, and it's just really, and it's it's so much fun. It's awesome. Right. Well, thank you again, Leo. Thank you, Rita. Thank you for your time. CW, Appreciate good it. to see you. You too, my friend. You guys are Pleasure. amazing. Thank you amazing. so much. Amazing, and yeah, anything, you know, anything I can do to help you, let me know. I appreciate it. All right. Thank All you. right.
Reeds, that was such a cool interview with Love Leo. Leo. Just such a, a great, warm individual and so many wonderful stories, you know, talking about his life. And we'll have to get him back on that, again. That work ethic, yeah. you know, just it's great stuff. Yeah. Rock and roll. It's a long way to the top, man, if you want to rock and roll. So thank you, Leo Rossi. Also, thank you to Warren at Parkhurst Galleries, Inc. in San Pedro for allowing us to use his gallery for our interview. Check out all the amazing artwork at parkhurstgalleries.com. For information on an autographed copy of Leo's book, When the Devil Smiles, the Angels Frown, My Life and Times in Rock and Roll, go to dub dub dub. That's me three times. Dub 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 Leo's L E O S book dot com. He will be kind enough to sign it for you and ship it to you. Check out Leo's appearances, lectures, and Princess Cruise Line presentations at a Knight's Tale. A Knights, K N I G H T S, tail, T A L E, dot O R G. For information on Leo's charity, 20K Watts, that's really easy also. Just go to dub dub dub, 20, 0, K, just the letter K, and Watts, W A T T S, dot com. Special thanks to our buddy Ted Luckus for giving us the idea to talk with Leo. Every show, we write up what we call show notes. You can find these under each description of our shows. These notes will give you more information and links to what was talked about in each show. So explore our website for more delicious facts. That was perfectly done. You can find more information at our website, which is rockandroll, R-O-C-K-A-N-D, roll, confessional dot R-O-C-K-S. And you can like us and heck even share us at Rock and Roll Confessional on Facebook and Instagram. So uh, please share and like and be friendly to all. And smile, because, you know, a a smile can just mean so much to somebody. I like that. That's a nice way to leave everything. Peace and love. Peace and love. Keep rocking, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.